My message tonight is entitled, Living Water versus Dead Water. The Bible has a lot to say about water. It's a picture of everlasting life. It's a picture of the work of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> when we're in the New Jerusalem and the heavenly city, new heavens and the new earth, there will be living water flowing from the throne of God. Tree of life springing up about it. The life that we were meant to have. The dominion that we were meant to have will be ours at that time. But tonight we'll talk about living water versus dead water. If you would turn your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 4. Gospel of John chapter 4. <clears throat> So looking in the hymn book as we were singing our hymn sings, see wherever I could find um, the hymn or chorus, um, Springs of Living Water. I couldn't find it. And I wasn't sure if I would remember all the words, but you know, it goes at least in part, I thirsted in a barren land of sin and shame. And what's the answer to that? The living water that Christ provides living water. Let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 4. We'll look at verses 7 through 14. <clears throat> we'll pick it up at verse 6, actually. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. In other words, it was noon. There cometh a, wo a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, hast this drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? our father Jacob, which gave us the well, gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Let's pray together. Father, as we look into your word this day, help us to indeed feast upon thy living word, that thy spirit be living water within us. Father, a wellspring from which we can draw for our sustenance to meet the needs of a dead and dying world. Lord, we ask that you'll bless us now as we worship together in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so as I was doing the scripture reading today, I was trying to give you a, a flavor of what's going on here. Jesus has traveled. Normally the Jews would travel and avoid Samaria completely if they were going north to the Sea of Galilee. Jesus traveled through it. Of course, Jesus being God knew that he already had an appointment. He needed to share the gospel with, with this Samaritan woman. But there was antipathy between the Jews and the Samaritans. In, in Samaritans, in, the, in Jewish eyes, Samaritans were half-breeds. They are squatters, ne'er-do-wells who were 
had taken over some of the holy land that belonged to the Jews alone. The Jews in the Samaritan eyes were holier than thou elitists, hypocrites. Notice when the woman spoke to Jesus, and I can imagine there was a tone in her voice. I know you're a Jew. What are you asking me anything for, you elitist? This is Jacob's well. Our fathers have given Jacob's well because Jacob's our father. Well, that was half true. Because the Samaritans are a mixture of Jew and Gentile. But Jesus doesn't get drawn into the argument. You know, sometimes we, we fall into the trap of getting drawn into unnecessary arguments. When we share the living Christ with others. Jesus would have none of it. He didn't correct her and say, well, no, at best you're, you know, perhaps half owners of Jacob's well, at best. You know, your father is not really Jacob, but he's my father. No, he didn't, he didn't get into it with her. He drew her attention back to her need. Jesus said, if you knew who I was, and remember, she thought he knew who, she already thought he knew, she knew who he was. He was a Jew. Someone she did not like. Because she figured, yeah, this is a Jew that's looking his nose down at me. I'll show him. <laughs> he thinks he's getting water from me? He's got another thought coming. He's getting nothing from me. Draw his own water if he dares. Maybe, maybe some of my buddies will beat him up when he tries. Who knows what was going on in her mind? We're not told all that. Couldn't only surmise, but Jesus draw her back, drew her back to the matter at hand. If you knew who, who I was and the gift that I could give you of living water, of eternal life, you would have asked for that. Jesus was offering a gift, not condemnation. A gift of God. Look at verse 10 again. If thou knewest the gift of God, you would say, give me to drink. And he, or I, would give you living water. Turn, if you would, to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. This gift of God that Jesus mentions, Paul develops it. We're very familiar with it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved. Jesus was offering grace. Remember, Jesus was this woman's creator. He's, she's mouthing off to him. He could have said, Wise mouth ceased to exist. In his mercy, he didn't give her what she deserved. Instead, in his loving kindness, he gave grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. There's that phrase, the gift of God, not of works, unless any man should boast. You know, the Samaritans thought that their form of worship was superior to the Jews, and the Jews, vice versa. The Jews were actually correct. But the Samaritans thought that their place of worship, their form of worship, was superior. They were trying to work their way to heaven, doing good works, at least in their eyes. There are many people who figure, eh, I'll be okay. I've done more good things than bad things. Well, we know that's not true. But we also know that it's impossible for us to work our way to heaven. The only way we can get there is through grace, through faith. And we're given that faith as a gift by the grace of God. We don't deserve it. It 
Because if we deserved it, if we deserved heaven, then it wouldn't be grace, it would be justice. We gaining our justice earned, we're going to heaven. Yep, I'm a good guy. No, I'm scum. I'm dirt. A wretched man that I am. Chief of sinners. Jesus had to humble the Samaritan woman. If we read on in the story, we, we see her, we see Jesus getting her attention. Why don't you go get your husband? Oh, wait. Which one? You've been married several times, and the one you're with now isn't really your husband, is it? How'd you know all that about me? He humbled her. He got her attention. Brought her to the realization that she couldn't earn her way to heaven. Part of repentance is humbling ourselves, realizing we have no means of achieving heaven. Letting others know they have no means of achieving heaven. It's God's unmerited favor. What about that gift of God? Look at Romans chapter 6. So we've got grace through faith, getting that gift of God. Romans chapter 6, very familiar passage to us. Another very familiar passage to us, I guess I should say. Another aspect of the gift of God. For the wages of sin is death. There's a famous sermon. It's called Payday Someday. Everyone is eventually going to get paid. Without Christ, their payment is eternal death, eternal hell, eternal suffering, eternal torment, a place of flame, fire, darkness. And people joke, eh, I'm going to hell, but that's okay, all my friends will be there. Yeah, well, they may be. You won't be enjoying time with them. You won't be able to see them. It's a place of eternal darkness. Because God will not be there. God is light. Hell is hell because God will not be there. Our souls innately need God. Rejecting Christ means eternity without him. Eternal darkness. Eternal darkness. Wages earned. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What gifts we've gotten? By grace we get faith. By grace we get eternal life. Look at else we get. Turn, if you would, back to John chapter 1, Gospel of John chapter 1. Look at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, well, not by our will, nor by the will of man, but of God. We're adopted, we're God's children. You know, people like to say, Oh, I'm a child of God, meaning. He's my creator. True. But your bastard sons without Christ. We're true sons of God. We're adopted into back into the family. The fellowship that had been broken by Adam's sin and our sin has been restored. We have the right to be called the children of God. Look at 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. So, 
We have the gift of adoption. <clears throat> First John chapter 5, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. We've been given the gift of understanding. Our, the, the scales that are over our eyes have been removed. We can see and understand and know about the living God. We can learn and understand the benefits of eternal life. We've been given the gift of understanding. There's more. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. What other gifts do we get? It's like an eternal Christmas tree. No, can't exhaust the gifts under the tree. I get my fingers to work, we'll get to James. James chapter 1. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We're given everything that could be that we would ever desire, anything that's good for us, anything that is complete and completes us in him. Both in this world and for eternity. Every good and perfect or complete gift. And then, of course, what's the ultimate gift? Well, let's turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. A gift is given, isn't it? Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Remember that gift of eternal life, that living water. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Oh yeah, we got the gift of faith, didn't we? And why did we get these gifts? By the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but half, present tense, everlasting life. We've gotten the gift of his son. What greater gift could there be than the eternal God himself seeking fellowship with us, choosing us to fellowship with him forever? Living water indeed. Sadly, many people reject God's gift. They try to satisfy themselves with temporary things. Money. Power. Fame. Guys. Gals. Phones. Fast cars. TV. The internet whatever it might be. People turn to things they think will satisfy them because of this innate need, this itch that they just can't quite scratch, this emptiness that they, they sense within them and yet can't fill. Christ means to fill that emptiness with springs of living water. Christians could fall in the trap of trying to fill that hole with dead water, dead things. 
Only God's perfect and ultimate gift, the living God, Son of God, can break the power of sin and its bondage, its slavery, and replace that enslavement with a life of forgiveness, a life of gratitude, a life of obedience. You know, there's nothing like a ice-cold drink of water. I remember being at my uncle's farm near Valley Forge, hot summer day, coming in from the fields, going into the kitchen, turning on the water to get a glass of water. My Aunt Ruth saying, no, oh, not so fast, Keith. Don't, don't take the water right away. Let it run. Well, on my uncle's farm, behind the house, about 100 yards away, there was a little spring house. And if you let that water run, the water comes from the spring house. From underground, where it's permanently 50 degrees or so. Filtered through the minerals. That's what I've ever had. Nothing compared with the living water of Christ, but oh, what a drink of water that is. My Uncle Wayne's farm. Ever been out exercising on a hot day and you drink some water? It refreshes, it revitalizes. Jesus was in a dry and dusty town. He'd been walking for miles. He was thirsty. You know, he feels the same things we feel. He knows about our troubles. He knows what it's like to be thirsty. And not just thirsty for water. Thirsty for filling. Thirsty for having our needs met. He needed a good cold drink of, from that well. But he expressed something to that lady that, that we know as well. You know, we, we're out playing tennis on a hot summer day and we get that cold drink. It satisfies us. But how long are we satisfied? How long till we're thirsty again? Well, in verse 13 in our text, Jesus expresses that. Let's look again back in John chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 13. John chapter 4, verse 13. Jesus answers and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now Jesus was certainly talking about that well water, as refreshing as it might be. But he's also talking about those things that we try to fill in the gap, fill in that empty space, that hole in our lives, that itch that we can't quite scratch spiritually. All earthly pleasures, even ones that are, aren't sinful in and of themselves, all earthly pleasures, all activities, even the legitimate ones are fading. Jesus was offering to the Samaritan woman. Jesus offers to us. Jesus offers to those who might be listening on the internet. Jesus offers to those that we might meet eternal satisfaction and eternal blessing. Turn with me, if you will, to one of my favorite verses. Turn to the book of Psalms. Psalm 16. The very last verse. Verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Think about the, sometimes our lives seem like they're drudgery. The same thing day after day. Week after week, year after year, decade after decade. You know what? Eternity is never going to be boring. 
pleasures at the right hand of God forevermore. The water that Jesus gives represents eternal life, represents the work of God's Holy Spirit. It's a fountain of eternal duration. We'll never be able to exhaust that well. So that's a picture of living water. What about the dead water that I mentioned? You know, water is essential to life. You know, NASA, the European Space Agency, probably the Chinese Space Agency, they're all sending probes. They're all looking into the heavens, looking for life. And what do they always look for to see where there might be life? They look for water. As much as I like science fiction, there's no life out there other than perhaps a few human beings in the space station. No physical life out there. No water that we know of. Water is a miracle of God. It's a remarkable substance. Miraculous in its design. Simple. Two hydrogen atoms chemically bonded to an oxygen atom. But bonded in precise detail. I've forgotten now, I think it's 104 and a half degrees, 107 and a half degrees. But a precise figure that those hydrogen bonds, hydrogen atoms are bonded to the oxygen atom. And they have to be bonded in precisely that angle for water to have all the essential qualities that it has in order to sustain life. For example, water is the universal solvent. Many, many things dissolve in water. That's a good thing because what's the chief component in our blood? It's water. And dissolved into that blood is oxygen. Carbon dioxide is waste. Nutrients, hemoglobin, various ions, just to name a few. And yet if you try to, you know, rubbing alcohol, for example, is a solvent. Gasoline is a solvent. If God put gasoline into our veins, that would be a bad thing, but if God had designed us to have gasoline in our veins and, dissolve, and tried to dissolve all the things that are in our blood, our blood wouldn't flow. It would be sludge. Water, the universe solvent, enables all the various things that are in our blood to completely dissolve and flow easily through our veins. Water has a high specific heat, which means that it allows large bodies of water, like the oceans, to moderate our climates. So if you're near the water, it doesn't get as cold in the winter. It doesn't get as hot in the summer. That's why we like to go to Ocean City, don't we? But it moderates, in other words, if you go to Kansas in the summertime, it's really hot. It'd be far worse if there weren't oceans. Another important quality of water is that unlike any other substance, when it freezes, when it turns into a solid, it becomes less dense. Ice floats in liquid water instead of sinking to the bottom. In other words, the molecules, instead of getting closer together, like anything else, when it turns phases from, from liquid to solid, those molecules slow down and get closer together. Water, they slow down, but they start to get closer together and then they kind of whoop, spread out a little bit. So that means that water, solid water, floats on liquid water. And therefore, lakes freeze from the top down instead of the bottom up. It would only take one winter, if it was the other way around, it would only take one winter to eliminate all life 
in all our bodies of water that freeze. But guess what? In all its miraculous, in all its wonderful design, H2O is a, is a chemical. Is it alive? Does it have the attributes of life? Does it reproduce? No. Does it take in energy? Well, it can absorb it, but it doesn't transform it. It has no, none of the qualities of a living thing. It's dead. Just as the activities that we attempt to fill our cisterns, as it were, are dead as well. People outside of Christ and, and sometimes even Christians are often attracted to the dead water of the world. It has qualities that, that seem nice and impressive. Turn, if you would, please, to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 2. Here God's describing this dead water. Jeremiah chapter 2. We'll pick it up in verse 13. For my people, that's God's people, not the world, for my people have committed two evils. Of course, the world's done the same thing. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, they don't think they're broken. They think they're holding water, but it's dead water, and it's not going to hold living water from God. Verse 14, is Israel a servant? Is he a homeboard slave? Why is he spoiled? Why is he being robbed? Why is he being defeated by his enemies? Verse 15, the young lions roared upon him. Lions like the Assyrian Empire, lions like the Chaldeans, hungry, ravenous, seeking their land, seeking to destroy, seeking to rob, and succeeding. The young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made his land waste, and his cities are burned without an inhabitant. Also the children of Noph and the Tehapanines have broken the crown of thy head. Hast thou not procured this unto thyself? In other words, have you reaped exactly what you've sown? In that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when I was led thee by the way? And what now hast thou to do in the way of Egypt? To drink the waters of Sihor? Or what hast thou to do with the way of Assyria? To drink the waters of the river? Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts, the ruler, great I am, of armies. In other words, what's going on here? God's message is that the land of Judah was in danger. The Chaldeans were coming and they were going to win the Babylonians. In fact, as we read through the book of Jeremiah, God's message is don't fight them. You're going to lose. The time of your punishment is at hand. I'm not going to help you. They're there for me to punish you for rejecting me. But I'm still your God. I will not ultimately reject you, and this punishment will not last forever. He tells them it will last for 70 years. But God's people rejected the message, even now, even then. They said, we want to drink this dead water, the water of the Egyptians, the Nile, the water of the Assyrians, the great Euphrates. We're going to store up water, this dead water in cisterns. Of course, God was speaking figuratively, spiritually. They were depending on anything but God. 
horses, chariots, armies, making an alliance with Egypt. Think of that. The enemies who treat, tried to destroy them, enslave them for 400 years, are making an alliance with them. How often do we as God's people make alliance with the world? The waters of Sihir, literally the Black River, refers to the Nile. You know, Egypt was the gift of the Nile because every year it would, it would flood, it would inundate, bringing with it fresh soil, new nutrients to the land. They wanted to align themselves with their slaveholders. The other river, the uh, Euphrates River, again, represented Assyria and Babylonia and so on, these conquerors. The Assyrians were the world's first terrorists, trying to make an alliance with those that destroyed the northern kingdom to fight the Chaldeans. Egypt, the Assyrians, these other peoples, these other rivers, non-living water, represents sin and Satan. Satan holds sinners in bondage to sin by fear of death. Trying to ally themselves with the Assyrians, trying to ally themselves with the Egyptians were wrong on many levels, but it paints a spiritual picture. We can fall into the same track, thinking that the world, the flesh, and the devil can satisfy us. It's the deceitfulness of sin. Look at Jeremiah chapter 20. For of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands. I broke your slavery. I broke your ties to sin. Yet the people only wanted to drink the dead water from the worldly rivers. Not only did they want to drink it, they wanted to store it up. How often do we store the things of the world? In our minds, in our bank accounts, perhaps, wherever it might be. But God is saying, go ahead, store up the dead water. It'll do you no good. And by the way, your cisterns are going to leak. You can't store it up. Turn, if you would, to, to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14. Pick it up in verse 8. Picture of the Savior coming. Picture of the Lord's second coming. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them to the former sea and half of them to the hinder sea. In summer and winter it shall be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. And all the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate and the corner gate, from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's wine presses. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. God's people will be living with God. Living waters will be coming forth. We're going to reign with him during the millennium. What blessing we're going to see. Look at verse 12, same, same book, same chapter. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in the holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Doesn't sound like a good thing to fight God, does it? Now it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one of, on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. Look at Revelation chapter 20. We get living water. What do they get? Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And 
And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Not a lake of living water, a lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Those who choose to reject God, those who choose to reject living water, those who want dead water, fill their cisterns with it, fill their lives with it. Well, they will have a lake to go to, but it's a lake of fire. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Almost done. What's God want us to do with this abundant living water? Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verses 19 and 20. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, living water and dead water, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, and that thou mayest dwell in the land unto which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. Choose life. Choose the living water. Share that living water with others. Lastly, turn with me back to the Gospel of John. Chapter 6. Gospel of John, chapter 6. Verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh unto me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye have seen me and believe not, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which I have, uh, he hath given me I shall lose nothing. He should raise it, but should raise it again at that last day. And this is the will of him that hath sent me, that Everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. If we've trusted Christ, if we have living water, we don't need to worry about being in that great white throne of judgment. We don't have to worry about the record books of God which have recorded every thought, every word, every motive, every deed, being written, standing condemned. Finally, the book of life being opened, and nope, that name is not there. Depart from me, thou worker of iniquity. We not need worry about that. Our names, if we've accepted Christ, if we have that living water, already in that book of life, permanently etched, we will not have to stand before that great white throne. Yes, we'll stand before Christ. We'll be standing to see whether we get rewards or we'll get into heaven, as Paul says, by the skin of our teeth. But no matter what, we will have living water. We will have eternal life. We will have eternity with God with whom there are pleasures at his right hand forevermore.
Father, we pray that you'll bless us. Help us to reject the dead water of the world. Reject the dead water of the world, the flesh, and the devil. It seems like good water. Tasty water. Refreshing water. And yet it's a lie. Help us be filled with the living water. Help us to show that living water to others. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close tonight, let's turn in our celebration hymnals to him 548. As the deer, as the deer panteth for water, do we pant, do we long for living water? Do we long after the living God? Let's stand and sing all the verses of him.